Hello everybody. So today we're going to talk about soil science and its role in the urban forest. But um, we're going to kind of, you know, give a more general soils lecture because I mean I think just soils important um, overall. But I mean it's got its role for urban forests, forests, um, grasslands, for everything. Soil is extremely important. What do I mean? Well, all natural resources are soils or derivatives of soils. Farms, crops, forests, livestock, and wildlife resolve themselves into questions of soil. Soil is therefore the basic natural resource. And that's the opinion of Aldo Leopold. Uh, and I, I firmly uh, believe this as well, as soil is the most basic of all natural resources. It's where everything uh, comes from. If you want to be the the purist who goes that it actually all comes from the water, I can I can agree with that too. But once we hit the land, then the soil is is that key natural resource. So um, I like to really kind of dive into this uh, the idea of um, you'll hear people talk about dirt all the time, um, but I like to talk about soil because soil and dirt. Are not the same thing. Soil contains microorganisms, organic matter, or earthworms, earthworms, and other um, earthworms, insects, microbes, uh, all sorts of other organisms within it. Soil is a living environment. It's an e it's an ecosystem, whereas dirt is dead soil. Now, can you turn dirt back into soil? Yes. Add water, add organic matter, those sorts of things, and you can turn dirt back into uh, soil, but when people say soil and dirt, they will use them interchangeably, but they're different. Soil is a living environment, dirt is dead soil. So what is soil? Soil is a dynamic living natural body capable of supporting vegetative cover. That's a nice simple definition um, of soil. A dynamic living natural body capable of supporting vegetative co cover. Um, the, you could Simplify it down and say it's rock, sand, silt, clay, and organic matter um, that anchors roots and provides water and minerals to trees. That's um, one basic thing that it does as well, but uh, it, there's more to it. Uh, here specifically, where does our soil come from? It's derived from um, decomposed and weathered um, parent material, and that parent material is, um, is granite from the Sierra Nevada mountains. So if you're in, uh, if you live more towards the Sierras, it's granite is going to be your parent material. But down here in um, Bakersfield, it's alluvium um, through the Kern River that's been brought down from the Sierras. So it's granit it's granitic um, and probably some sort of um, sedimentary um, rock in there uh, mixed in there as well that's come down um, through the Kern River and then washed out into uh, the Kern River floodplain, which is basically now. Uh, Bakersfield. So, uh, looking at soil as this living, uh, dynamic uh, body capable of supporting vegetative cover, what what else does that mean? It's it's an ecosystem. It's got insects, earthworms, nematodes, fungi, bacteria, and other microbes and organisms that live in a delicate balance. That the the roots need the soil for structure the soil needs the roots for for sugars and for for nutrients the roots need the soil for water the organisms need the soil for air and for water the um you've got the nitrogen cycle you've got the carbon cycle uh all these things happening in this delicate balance all with um, all these different layers of soil working together and all these different organisms working and functioning together in, um, in symbiosis to enjoy um, this environment that the soil provides. So let's go uh, a little basic. So what is soil? So when you look at a piece of soil, you're going to look at it and um, what you're actually looking at is 45% mineral particles. So that's going to be our our texture, um, our texture of of a mixture of sand, silt, and clay. Every soil is just um, when we talk about these mineral particles is just a mixture of sand, silt, and clay. Uh, they they are uh, the they they all have 
uh, good and bad parts to them. So the best soil is a mixture of all three of them together. Uh, you've got about 5% is going to be organic matter. And when we say organic matter, we say that's about 10% organism, 10% roots, and 10% uh, humus. Humus being that decomposed material, that stuff um, from up above that is working its way back down into the soil. And humus is that stuff that's broken down that, you know, was this... Was this an organism, or was this some animal scat, or was this some leaves, or whatever? I can't really tell what it is anymore, but it's not quite soil. That's That stuff is what we classify as humus. And then the rest of the pieces of soil is um, is pore space that allows for air and water to to move through. Um, and it's And that's important because you need that air and water for all the things to be able to function inside of the soil. So here's just a basic look at a soil profile of a San Joaquin, uh, specifically the San Joaquin soil. The soil's name is San Joaquin. Um, and then it, you can see some of the different horizons. So these arrows here point uh, to the different uh, horizons. And if you say to yourself, well, what's a horizon? A horizon's just a different layer. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, just another look here at, at soil. This is in, um, in North County, San Diego, going um, uh, towards Del Mar. I took this just uh, on the side of the road because you, it's nice and exposed, and it really just gives you a look at, at you know what's, how the stuff grows up above and then what's actually going on underneath, as well as to give us a, a clue about uh, soil erosion. We can see the, the workings of, of wind and water erosion here on this on this cliff. So let's talk about those layers, uh, typical layers of a soil profile. So um, humus, if you got humus in your soil, it's going to give your topsoil uh, a rich dark brown color. Um, the the darker your soil is, the um, higher presence there is of organic matter. In it, that's why when you, um, if you go and buy fertilizer uh, at Home Depot or anywhere like that, it's it's like a dark, it's like a br a black brownish color to it because it's full of organic matter. Um, because organic matter is absolutely essential in the building of soil. And so, um, what I like to, the way I like to describe these layers is um, that you're you're working your way up from the bedrock, except for the organic matter layer, which is this surface litter layer, that's actually all this stuff that's on um, that's on the surface: uh, grass, twigs, leaves, uh, organisms, um, scat or or poop, and all this stuff that's going to eventually work its way down into the soil. So you've got an O layer on the surface that's getting things working its way down into the soil, and then everything else that's working its way up. That's why. The first layer we run to at, run into after this O layer, this surface litter layer, is the topsoil. And they call it the topsoil because it is the top of the soil working its way up. The O layer is just working its way down. So you've got your surface litter layer, you got your topsoil, your subsoil, your weathered bedrock, and then your bedrock. And they have specific letter designations to them. So O for surface litter, and that's an O for organic. And then A... Um, because they it kind of starts at the top here, so we go A, B, C, and then R because it's rock underneath. Uh, in C here, in the weathered bedrock, this is where you'll find groundwater um, because you have roots usually making it all the way through the topsoil and the subsoil. So this is the area where you don't get roots and plants pulling things up. So this is where you'll get your um, aquifers to happen um, because the water will hit here at the bedrock and work its way up. And so we'll get um, groundwater storage down here. So let's look, uh, take a more detailed look at each, uh, each layer. So just another kind of uh, look at it. Here's our surface litter, our topsoil, subsoil, parent material, and then bedrock would just be a solid um, mass of rock. So if we, um, so I guess I should preface this as we go into this typical grassland soil um, by saying that all soils are different. And so 
you these soil layers have to happen in a certain order meaning you're not going to have topsoil underneath uh, parent material that's never going to happen they have to they have to happen they have to happen in a certain uh, order however you can have layers that are missing so for instance in a desert because uh, you don't have a lot of um, things that live there or grow there or um, you know not a lot of wildlife not a lot of plants and those sorts of things you don't have an O layer in the desert so you could start off at an A or or possibly even a B layer um, in the in the desert uh, down if you go down into the Kern River uh, floodplain you start off at, at a uh, C layer um, some of the times so you start off down here you don't have any of this stuff up here but you can't have a B under a C or you can't have an A under a C there is an order that if those layers are there they have to be in this specific order but you can have layers missing you can have an A layer that goes to a C layer and there's no B layer it that's that's um, that can be confusing for people but at the same time I think that's also um, really interesting because that's why when you look around and you see well why are these plants growing here and those plants growing over there and no plants over there and why does everything look different but also it's kind of the same it's it's these little changes and and all these different things going on in the soil which um which make that you know give us this this crazy rich mosaic that we get to see and so here just a refresher here's if we are looking at a typical grassland soil, we got a couple inches of that organic uh, surface litter uh, horizon. Then we've got our A horizon, our topsoil, our B horizon, our subsoil, and our C horizon, which is you can go with weathered bedrock or parent material. And then we'd have an R horizon for, for bedrock. So the organic layer. Oh, too far. My fault. There we go. So, uh, in the uppermost layer, uh, this one's going to be rich in organic matter. And we can see in this picture, we got this nice dark color to it. If it's not a dark color or it's a lighter color, that just means less organic matter is there. Um, plant litter, uh, and when we say plant litter, we're talking about, you know, leaves that fall to the ground or twigs that fall to the ground or, um, or grass that, that dies, anything like that that hits the ground and then eventually starts the decay process and works its way back into the soil. Those are the things that accumulate in this uh, surface litter layer. And like I said before, in the desert, the O horizon is completely absent because there's just not enough stuff to make up an organic layer. There we go. The top soil, or our A horizon, our next horizon down from the top. It's dark and rich. Uh, if it's got a lot of organic matter and humus in it, if it doesn't have um, a high amounts, just like um, the layer above, it doesn't have high amounts, it'll be a lighter color. Uh, usually has a granular texture and nutrients may be lost and um, work their way down into the other layers below, which is not necessarily a bad thing because um, you do want to, um, the soil wants to support uh, all of its layers. A granular texture, what that means is is that um, usually your little um, pieces of soil or your little aggregates are going to be kind of angular, um, well really more spherical, like little um, spherical um, blocks like cookie crumbs is a good way to think of it. Like take an Oreo cookie and crush it up in your hand and what that looks like would be kind of a granular texture. Uh, you're definitely going to have plant roots uh, present in the the topsoil and uh, soils higher in organic matter are darker in color and they also have a greater water holding capacity that's a really um, important part of having organic matter in your soil is that they're very good at at water holding which is great because it holds on to the water makes it available for the for the plants and um, really helps in making sure that your soil uh, works correctly uh, if this was a forested horizon or a uh, forested soil, so we talked about this being a typical grassland soil, but if it's a forested soil, you're going to get an E horizon here where you're going to get, so we went O and A, then you're going to get an E horizon 
before you get to um, the B horizon and the C horizon. And I know for you, uh, if you're people like, if you're just like me, you say to yourself, wait a minute, you just told me A, B, C, and now there's E, and E doesn't make any sense because that's not in order. And yes, so those letter designations, they don't really go in order, right? We start with O, and then we go to A. So that doesn't necessarily um, uh, work. You know, I would, you know, somebody like me prefer it was like, you know, A, B or something like that to, to so that it you understand that it's in between A and B. To me, that would make more sense, but it's designated E because E stands for eluvium, which is the process of the nutrients um, working their way uh, down through down through the soil in this um, this leaching that happens. And basically, what's happening is that um, because you in the forest you have um, fungi as opposed to bacteria um, in in a grassland soil, uh, your most of your microbes are bacteria, whereas in a um, forested soil. You have uh, fungi growing in here. You've got a mycorrhizae symbiotic relationship with the soil, which really helps the, the roots um, extend themselves and be able to pull in uh, more nutrients and more water to support the, support the trees. And because you have that, what you end up with is this uh, leaching layer uh, below, this uh, alluviation, zone of alluviation and leaching. So that E stands for alluviation. And... Um, it's also, it also can happen um, due to uh, heavy precipitation or irrigation. This layer is going to be lighter in color. That's how you're going to tell that it's there because you go from dark to dark to really light and then to a, it's not necessarily a darker color, but it's going to be a darker color than this um, layer that's above it. And it's um, usually present in forest soils because of the uh, presence of fungi, uh, but not typical for grassland soils. So going back to a grassland soil, that takes us back to B. So we went O to A to B. And um, with our B, it's a lighter color. Um, usually the nutrients have um, leached out of the topsoil. You'll still see plant roots uh, down in here in the B horizon. And the B horizon is typically rich in iron and aluminum uh, compounds and has uh, more of a clay component in it in terms of the idea that all soils are sand, silt, and clay, so there's going to be a heavier amount of clay uh, in the in these layers. As you go down here in your layers too, you're also your soils are going to get more compacted, meaning there's going to be less pore space uh, for water and air to, to work their way through as you go down uh, the soil. That takes us to C, the parent material. Um, the sea horizon contains weathered bedrock right here, uh, pieces of rock and borders the unweathered solid bedrock, which is down below. Generally, you find no plant roots here, and that's important because then that's where our aquifers usually end up is in the sea horizon or if we have um, horizons below the sea horizon. Um, you'll get saturated with groundwater and you'll get your aquifers to form, which is just the... Um, the um, pores between the rocks where the where the water stores up and then below that you just get your bedrock which is just you know your big solid piece of rock that nothing goes goes down uh, below so those are our soil horizons so let's kind of uh, summarize that and kind of give you a look here uh, where you can kind of see some of these differences so you get an O horizon you get a surface uh, a litter layer horizon then you get an A horizon so here's our here's our topsoil, dark color, not as dark as the as the surface uh, litter layer, but still pretty dark. Uh, we get a B horizon, um, which is uh, this one specifically has an accumulation of K, clay, um, so much more clay in it than this one. And you can see we talked about the idea of that granular texture, so more like cookie crumbles up here versus here. We've got this really um, really reddish color, which lets us know that there's a um, good amount of iron and, and probably some oxidation happening uh, in this in this heavy clay layer. You get down here into the sea horizon. Down here you see that little bit of change right there. This part right here doesn't quite look like this. And that's going to be our sea horizon, not very big. Uh, it says, could be weathered rock, unconsolidated floodplain sediments, or loose sands. 
and then we hit our 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 hard bedrock down here and so in this soil it's only you know 40 42 inches and then you're you're on to hard bedrock some soils you can go um, a lot farther down just kind of depends oh, I went too far I believe I don't know why that won't show up so we'll just skip it obviously not that important so just another way to look at it. So we got our O horizon. Uh, so our surface litter layer, you get that's you get intense biological activity happening there because you got things that are that are dying and working their way back into the soil. You got our A horizon, our top soil, you get some leaching happening where things are working their way down into the other soils. You got your B horizon zone of accumulation of fine materials. Uh, you know, a lot more clay in your soil. C horizon, you can see here, you can see those big pieces of um, weathered bedrock. You can actually see the rock mixed in with the soil. And then bedrock down here where you, it gets to be just that one solid mass and nothing is going to go between. You can see that, you know, soil, you know, here's our topsoil, plant roots, things like that. You know, a little bit of plant roots, the bigger plant roots making its way down into the B horizon. And then eventually, you know, our big pieces of rock, and then the soil just kind of stops, and we just hit full out rock. So, just uh, if you want to, you could uh, press pause right here and just kind of um, try and figure out which is the best uh, way with what I have described right here. Uh, in terms of trying to figure out which one of these down here is the correct order from top to bottom uh, for these soils. So if we work our way, 3, 4, 1, 2. So if we're talking about our O horizon, that's a thin layer of decomposing organic material. Our A horizon, number four, has fine absorbing roots of the trees and is very biologically active. This layer is normally rich in organic matter. Number one, fine textured materials from the horizon above and soil particles from the lower parent material. So that one gives us a good clue that says the lower parent material. So it's got to be above the, parent, the weathered bedrock or the parent material layer, which is C. And then it also says fine material textured materials from the horizon above, which we talked about that A layer leaching things down into the B layer. So number one is our B layer, and then our C horizon is number two, partially weathered parent material. Parent material, material remember from the beginning of our talk, is that bedrock that, that this soil formed from, which down here is alluvium from that Kern River outwash coming from the Sierras. Tree roots. So tree roots are definitely important in the soil. Uh, tree roots grow where the soil conditions are favorable. Roots uh, require space among the soil particles or organic materials and essential mineral ele elements, and they need adequate oxygen and water. And that's why it's extremely important um, that your soil uh, is aerated and that your soil does not um, get compacted because uh, we talked about soil being half pore space for water and um, and air. And so in order for roots to get the adequate oxygen and water they need to function, you need to make sure that you have macro pore space and micro pore space. So big, large pore spaces or, and small pore spaces for that water and the air to work their way into the soil. Most of the fine absorbing roots uh, for trees are found in the upper six to 10 inches of soil. So that's going to be in your um, in your topsoil layer for the most part and tree roots seldom we grow deeper than three to four feet so then you know your deepest roots are going to go into that B horizon but not really anywhere below that so here's just a look of a picture the idea of healthy soil where it's not compacted it's moist lots of nutrients so you can see your um, your peds or your aggregates uh, in terms of you got um, your soil and you got um, your uh, pieces of soil have are kind of bound together but then there's also spaces in between the soil where you can get um, water and air 
uh, and the, then the plant roots to be able to move and work their way in and tap into the soil where they can um, do cation exchange and be able to pull nutrients out of the soil and bring water up to the tree while the tree provides it uh, with other nutrients and with sugars uh, coming from the process of photosynthesis. And that gives us a nice, healthy-looking crown, nice, straight trunk, good-looking tree, as opposed to a tree where we might look at it and say, hey, you know, what's going on here? It's it, The crown is thin. It doesn't look great. You know, maybe first thought is, was it some sort of a bad pruning job? And once we realize it's not that, then we might start thinking, well, what's happening underground? And what does it look like? And, um, you know, maybe we're dealing with some compacted soils or dry soil or we just have some sort of a lack of nutrients because we know our tree should look something more like this. So here's another look at, at what's going on and the importance of that, that pore space, the air space between soil particles and small pores. So you get, um, you got your pieces of organic matter, which are, which are important because they hold water really well. We've got our, our aggregates, our soil particles. So that's, got you know our minerals our sand silt and clay uh, mixed in there and then we've got these spaces in here this white space in here that's that's a macro pore and in that macro pore that can either be filled by water or by air um, and then in this specific uh, instance here there's also an addition of fertilizer and fertilizer is adding um, some some chemicals uh, mixed in or it's a chemical uh, mixture that's really just um, organic matter and, and minerals um, that might aid uh, the plant in growth um, and so or aid the soil as well. But you can see the idea of if you've got these big macro pores like this, really easy to get your plant roots in there, really easy to get um, air and oxygen and carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is important because all the soil microbes in here um, they're giving off some carbon dioxide so the carbon dioxide needs to go out but also we need to pull some in as well and then um, lots of room also for water because we get that precipitation and then water can work its way down and leach uh, help that leaching process where um, we can work and get some of the minerals that are up here on the topsoil which is great because we want to keep some of those but we also want to share with the layer below us so if we look at chemical and physical properties of soil we'll kind of just go through this um, you know relatively quickly uh, it's, a, it's a lot to cover um, so let's let's see what we can figure out so we're going to talk about texture, structure, and acidity. Those are the ones we're going to focus on. And so why focus on these ones? Because these, um, when, you, um, when you talk about these specific things, they're going to help determine what plan, plants, what plants can and cannot grow in a certain area, how quickly those plants can grow, how much biomass those plants are going to produce, so like how um, healthy and, and vigorous those plants are going to be. Uh, susceptibility to erosion and water movement or the transmission of water whether you know water is going to move into the soil or water is just going to kind of run off the top like um, what we think of uh, flooding doing and suitability for roads and buildings in terms of the idea of them um, sitting on a nice solid structure so we're going to start with uh, with texture and so when we say texture we're just talking about like um, the relation um, the relative proportion of grain size. And so fancy terminology, what does that mean? It just, like I said before, every soil is made up of sand, silt, and clay. And so when we talk about the texture, we're really just talking about, well, how much sand and how much silt and how much clay is in this specific um, soil that we're dealing with. And so what's kind of the difference between sand, silt, and clay? So sand, um, those are the only soil particles that are large enough for our eyes to see them. Uh, under a microscope, we could see um, silt and uh, clay, but it's very, very small. Um, sand is going to have a gritty feel to it. Think about the idea of sandpaper. Silt is going to be um, smaller than sand particles. Silt, silty soils feel powdery, so think about um, flour, like all-purpose flour that you use in baking. And um, silt does not hold together well when wet. Uh, clay soils, those are the smallest soil particles, 
They have a very high water holding capacity because they have a huge uh, amount of surface area and they are smooth and sticky when wet. And so um, sa sand has that more kind of angular um, uh, kind of kind of um, look to it. Uh, silts are going to have kind of um, smaller spherical particles and then plate uh, clay has this are these small kind of plates and small kind of flat um, plates to them and that's how they have a uh, bigger surface area the way I like um, that it was described to me that really makes sense um, is that clay is going to have a huge amount of surface area compared to sand and silt and it's because of this flat um, platey texture and uh, an easy way to think about it is to think about a deck of cards. If a deck of cards is stacked up, you just see the one, the one stack of cards. It's got the four sides, and you're like, oh, it doesn't have that much surface area. But if you were to take all those cards and then stack them up one by one right next to each other, it would cover a much bigger area than that one deck of cards. Is. Then all of a sudden you lay them all out, and you cover a big area with that deck of cards. And that's the way clay is because it has such a high surface area and all these thin little pieces that it can it can actually um, it has a huge uh, surface area component so why is something like soil particle size important well one of the things we've talked about already a bunch is this idea of pore space the macro pore space and the micro pore space so uh, with sand big particles lots of space in between them water goes right through it silt you're kind of in the middle clay you got really small particles that have a lot of surface area they're going to catch water so water goes through it but it goes through it really really slow so anytime you see water pulled up so a reservoir a lake a river those sorts of things the soil is has a very high clay content because that's how it's able to hold the water um, at the up above there is technically water going through that soil, but it is going through at such a slow rate, it's almost like it's not happening. Um, clay texture is a lot like Play-Doh, is the way I, I like to describe it. So texture uh, will influence your water holding capacities, your drainage, your aeration, your organic matter content, and other properties. And so I really like um, this version of the soil texture triangle. Um, Soil texture triangle is uh, kind of a nice, easy way to figure out um, what your texture is. So there's 12 basic textures, which you see on this uh, chart here. You've got your, um, your pure sand, your pure clay, and your pure silt soils. And then you also have loam, which is kind of like the, the combination when you get a little bit or the, the, the nice perfect amount of all three. So if you have a very uh, a soil that's very high in clay, I'll move myself out of the way, very small particles, high water holding capacity, doesn't move water very quickly, which we know because if it holds water well, um, like, a, like a reservoir, the water, the water is not going to move through there um, very well. Um, but that also means there's less water available to the plants um, because it doesn't move water through the soil very well. The opposite kind of is this idea of sand large particles low water holding capacity think about the beach water comes in water goes into the soil goes right through and it's out again so it it moves water well it does not hold water well very poor storage of water and so you're like well silt's in the middle like goldilocks theory right well silt you got small particles again or medium-sized particles the way you want to think about it it's got low to mid water holding capacity, so pretty. It's it's okay water holding capacity. It's got okay mobility, and still it's got less water available to to plants because it has that low um, holding capacity and mobility. Whereas loam, so that's our our soil right here in the middle where we get um, basically the good parts of all of them. You got a blend of particles. You got high water holding capacity. You got good water mobility, and you got good storage and good availability to plants. So when people are farming or looking to raise crops, they're hoping that they've got a loam soil or something where you get a good combination of these, of these, uh, of these three textures. And so how do you use this triangle that I've uh, presented here in front of you? 
Well, it's it's a pretty easy um, thing. You just gotta make sure that you're reading the correct um, the correct side for the correct uh, texture. So on this side, we've got percent clay, and so you gotta think about this is uh, like a pure clay soil would be up here. So here's 100% clay, and this is the least amount of clay down here. So our percent clay goes up this way. A silty soil, so the most silty soil would be down here so that's where our hundred percent is and so this is the least silty soil and then our most sandy soil would be down here so our least sandy soil is down here and so you just have to find the right lines as you read through this so if i'm going to figure out which soil uh, is um, the a texture comprised of 30 percent clay 30 percent silt and 40 percent sand well, I'll start with 30% clay, so I come up, come here, and so 30% clay, so I find this nice straight line here, across like that. So I, if I had um, a line, actually, let me try this. I haven't tried this before. Let me draw a line right here. Oh, look at that. That's a terrible line. But you can see it's that line right there that I uh, wobbled through. Um, then you've got your silt, so your 30% uh, silt. So I come here, I find my silt, and that's 30. So I'm going to try, to, look at that. Oh, that's much better, huh? Uh, and I found that they crossed right there. And so um, the last one would be 40% sand, but if you've got two of these already, you'd have to have the third one because they have to add up to 100. So 30 plus 30 is 60, which means it would have to be 40, and that 40% line comes where those two intersect. And that means that our um, soil that we're looking at, let me just exit out of the drawing here, is a clay loam, which we said it was right here. Um, if we were to uh, change this up and say we only had 20% clay, that would be this line right here. So 20%, I would kind of draw like that. If I then had 30% silt, I'd come down here like this and find where it intersected 20, which is right here, and it would change it from a clay loam to just a loam. And then how much sand would we have left? Well, we had 20% of one and 30% of the other, which means it would have to be 50% sand because it always has to add up to 100. So that's another way to think about it is, is that it always has to add up to 100. So let's talk about loam. So loam is a mix of the three different particle sizes and is often considered the ideal soil texture because of the favorable characteristics for plant growth, right? It kind of gets the best. It's the best of all three worlds. Soil structure and texture determine the soil's ability to hold uh, water and provide oxygen to the roots, which is extremely important because um, it the when we talk about the, the texture and the structure, it's we're still really only talking about um, half of the soil. The other half being that pore space for the water and the air, which are going to help the, the plant roots and allow the plant roots to go. It's um, also important to understand kind of their roles. Clay is going to be much, clay is because of its surface area is, is really going to be important in terms of the, the chemical reactions. Uh, involved in the soil. Organic matter is also going to help out with that, whereas sand and silt are more um, are more structural, are more there to, to give it that, that structure. Uh, I, I describe it as a house, sand and silt. That's the, the wood frame to the house, and then um, um, the clay is like the drywall all over the place, really kind of starting to be able to allow you to put other things into that house. Uh, and texture is also going to help determine which species of trees will do well in a given in a given site because um, especially when it comes to that water holding and water moving capacity certain trees are going to need a lot of water and certain trees aren't going to need a lot of water and so certain trees are going to grow well in a in a higher sandier soil and certain trees will go grow well in a in a more clay soil um, but um, you know, when you have a loam soil, you're going to kind of, that's where, you know, you can probably get away with quite a bit.